All right. Hello. Uh, Anya's back. And I'm going to be starting the second language chapter from The Absorbent Mind, which is called How Language Calls to the Child. And in this one, in this video, I'm going to try and stop a little bit more and kind of share what I think or any extra notes that I've been studying about the content. We'll try to. Um, all right. So let me try to illustrate the many wonders of language of the language mechanism itself. It is well known that the central nervous system provides the living being with machinery for adjusting itself to the outside world and that the various sense organs, the nerves and the nerve centers, the muscular organs of movement or locomotion all have a part to play in this. But the existence of a language mechanism implies, in a way, something more than the presence of purely material factors. Areas of nerve cells or centers in the brain cortex were shown to be connected with language towards the end of the last century. Two of these are primarily involved, one being concerned with the hearing of speech, an auditory receptive center, and the other with the production of speech, of the movements required for vocalizing words. One of these is therefore a sensorial center and the other is a motor sensor. So that's the first part I can kind of stop at. Um, in my studies, I was learning about the different centers of the brain which do this. And that is called the Broca area and the Wernix area. So the uh, Broca area was discovered first in 1864 in the frontal lobe on the left hemisphere of the brain. So that one controls um, the yeah controls more of like the ability to make speech and to comprehend the language. Um, the other one is the Wernix area that was discovered 10 years later and that's a little bit behind the Broca area, more kind of located top of the ear there and it's funny that is more responsible for the auditory receptive, um, reception of speech. Um, yeah, so the Broca and the Wernix area, those are the two centres for language. In its visible aspects, the language apparatus has organs in which the same division can be seen. The organic centre of the ear receives the sounds of speech, and that of the mouth, throat, nose, etc. produces the sounds of speech. These two centres develop separately, both on the physiological and the psychological side. In some way, the hearing organs are connected to the mysterious seat of mental life, where the child's language is evolved in the depths of his unconscious mind. As for the motor side, its activities can be inferred from the astonishing complexity and precision of the movements needed to produce spoken words. It is very clear that this latter part develops more slowly and shows itself later than the other. Uh, that part being uh, the complexity and precision of movements needed to make words. And I see that a lot, especially with the, obviously the age that I work with nannying. I uh, work a nanny, a two-year-old. And even just watching his mouth trying to form different words. And it's like, it's a lot of effort. I think we don't appreciate how minute and specific the shapes of our mouths that we have to make with our mouths has to be to create a word. Um, so that develops more slowly and shows itself later. Uh, one asks why. It can only be because the sounds heard by the child provoke the delicate movements necessary to reproduce them. So the sounds must be absorbed and organised first and then they provoke the very precise movements of the mouth needed to make them. 
That, of course, is supremely logical, because if man is not blessed with a pre-established language, but has in fact to create one for himself, the child must naturally hear the sounds in use among his own people before he can repeat them. Hence, the movements for reproducing the words must be based on a collection of sounds registered in the mind, because the movements he will make depend on the sounds he has heard and which the mind has retained. That much we can readily understand, but we have to remember that speech is produced by a natural mechanism and not by logical reasoning. It really, it is really nature which is being logical, because of course, uh, if you ask a one or a two year old how they're processing language and forming that at that moment, they're not going to be able to give you a logical answer or even really know what you mean. So um, it's not logical reasoning, it's just a natural, spontaneous mechanism of life. What happens in studying nature is that the facts first of all come to our notice and then when we have understood them we say how logical they are. All of this leads naturally to the thought. There must be some intelligent force directing these events. The apparent influence of such an intelligent direction, acting creatively, is often more noticeable when the phenomena is psychological than when it is purely physical. Even um, though even then it is really striking. So when we see some kind of intelligent force happen, creating a psychological effect such as talking or, you know, being creative, being able to make a concept. We see that as more striking sometimes than the physical, um, than the, the physical, um, intelligent force. <laughs> so an example of this is flowers and all of their beauty and of their colouring and form. What is clear is that when the child is born, he, is, he has neither hearing nor speech. So what exists? Nothing. Yet all is ready to appear. There are these two centres, the Wernicks and the Broca Centre, uh, innocent of every sound and of all hereditary influences so far as a particular language is concerned. They have the power, nevertheless, to seize upon a language and to work up the movements needed to produce the words of it. They are parts of the machinery which nature uses to develop language in all its fullness. Probing still more deeply, it becomes apparent that, as well as these two nerve centres, there must exist a special sensitiveness and a ready, readiness to act, which is centralised too. The child's activity therefore follows his sensations of hearing. All, it's, all, it's, all is stupendously well arranged by nature, so that, the, so that directly the child is born, he can begin his work of, ado of adaption and of preparation for speech. The organs themselves form just one more part of these complex preparations. Observing them, we see a mechanism no less wondrous than the events which occur on the psychological side of life. The ear, which is formed by nature in the mysterious conditions of inter intrauterine life, is so delicate and complex an instrument that it seems like the contrivance of a musical genius, like the contrivance, like the creation of a musical genius. The central part of the ear reminds one of a harp, with strings that can vibrate in response to various sounds according to their length. The harp of our ear has 64 strings arranged in gradation, and because the space is so restricted, they arrange spirally, as in a seashell. Despite the limited space, Nature has been clever enough to provide everything needed for the reception of musical notes. But what is to make these strings vibrate? For if nothing strikes them, they will remain silent for years, like a disused piano. But in front of the harp, but in front of the harp, there is a resonating membrane, like the stretched surface of a drum, 
And whenever a noise strikes this membrane, the strings of the harp vibrate and our hearing picks up the music of speech. The ear does not respond to every sound in the universe because it doesn't have enough strings, but those it can resonate to complex music and a whole language can be transmitted in all its delicacy and refinement. The instrument of the ear is made in the wondrous prenatal life. If a child is born at seven months, um, at seven months uh, age in the uterus, the ear is already complete and is ready to uh, begin its work. How does this instrument transmit the sounds which reach it? sending them along the tiny nerve fibrils to that point in the brain where the special centres are located for their reception. Again, here we are facing one of nature's mysteries. But how is speech formed after birth? Psychologists who have made special studies of the newborn say that the slowest sense to develop is hearing. This is so widely believed that many maintain that children are born deaf. Um, also, this book was written just before she died, kind of around 1940s, 19, very early 1950s, probably yeah, 1940s. So um, this is old medical information, if you didn't know. There's probably a lot more updated stuff. I'm just reading this book for, obviously, authentic Montessori education. Um, to any kind of noise... Unless accompanied by violence, the newborn makes no response whatsoever. To my mind, this could have a mystical meaning. I find no reason to suspect insensitiveness, but rather a deep gathering in of the sound, a concentration of sensitiveness in its centres for language, especially in that which accumulates words. I reason that these centres are specially designed for the capture of language, of words, so it may be that this powerful hearing mechanism will only respond and act in relation to sounds of a particular kind, that of speech. The result is that words heard by the child set in motion the complicated mechanism by which he makes the movements needed to reproduce them. If there were no special isolation of the sensitivity which directs this, and if the centres were free to welcome every kind of sound, the child would start making the most astonishing noises. He would imitate all those peculiar to the place where he happened to be, including the non-human ones. It is only because nature has constructed and isolated these centres for, for the purpose of language that the child ever learns to speak at all. There have been wolf children abandoned in the forest, from which later they have made miraculous escapes, and these children, although they have lived amid the cries of animals and birds, the murmuring of water and the rustling of leaves, remain completely dumb. They emit no sound of any kind, since they have never heard the human tongue which alone has the power to activate the machinery of speech. I emphasise this because I want to show that a special mechanism exists just for language. Not the possession of language in itself, but the possession of this mechanism which enables men to make language of their own, is what dis distinguishes, distinguishes the human species from any other kind of animal. Words, therefore, are a kind of fabrication which the child produces, thanks to the machinery which he finds at his disposal. At his disposal. Not disposable. It's not disposable. Um, in the mysterious period which follows immediately after birth, the child, <coughs> who is a psych who, the child, who is a psychic entity endowed with a specially refined form of sensitiveness might be regarded as an ego asleep. But all of a sudden he wakes up and hears delicious music. All his fibres begin to vibrate. The baby might think that no other sound has ever reached his ears, but really it was because his soul was not responsive to other sounds. Only human speech had the power to stir him. I really like that bit. I'm going to read that again. 
the child, who is a psychic entity endowed with a specially refined form of sensitiveness, might be regarded as an ego asleep. But all of a sudden he wakes up and hears delicious music. All his fibres begin to vibrate, and the baby might think that no other sound had ever reached his ears, but it really was because his soul was not responsive to any other sound but that of human speech. Like, like that's how we create the whole ego, you know, as they say, the baby might be regarded as an ego asleep. We need words and language to create an image of ourselves and of the world in our mind. That is how we come to be. So, of course, they're asleep before that language is there to develop that. If we remember the great compelling forces that create and conserve life, we can understand how it is that formations due to this music must remain forever, and why the means for preserving the, continu the continuity of language are the new beings who keep on arriving in this world. So, yeah, the means for preserving language are the new beings who keep on arriving in the world. Babies. <laughs> Whatever is formed at that time in the child's me meme, meme, I don't know how to say that, the M-N-E-M-E, -M -E, which is basically like that, oh, I need a, yeah, don't worry about it, we'll do it later. <laughs> um, so whatever is formed in the child's name, which is basically that whole construction of a self, there, that psychic entity in them, so whatever is formed in that period has the power to become eternal. Let me check how long we've been going. All right. I'll do a little bit more and then I think I'll end. Um, it is also this way with rhythmic songs and dances. Every human group loves music. Each creates its own music just as it does its own language. And each group responds to its own music by bodily movements and accompanies it by words. The human voice is a music, and words are its notes, meaning nothing in themselves but to which every group attributes its own special meaning. In India, hundreds of languages separate the groups, but music unites them all, proof once again of the retentivity of childhood. Let us think what this means. None of the animals have music and dancing, but the whole of mankind, in all of parts of the world, knows and makes up dances and songs. These sounds of speech become fixed in the unconscious. We cannot see what goes on within the living being, but the external happenings offer us a guide. First to become fixed in the little one's unconscious are the single sounds of language, the syllables, and this is the basic part of the mother tongue syllables or and then we might call it the alphabet so those single parts words follow but these are used without understanding as happens sometimes when the child reads aloud from his teacher or his parent but how wisely is all of this work conducted within the child is a tiny teacher who works like one of those old-fashioned teachers who used to make the children first all recite the alphabet and then produce syllables and then words. Except that that teacher did it at the wrong time when the child had already learned it for himself and was in full possession of language. The inner teacher instead does it at the right time. The child first fixes the sounds and then the syllables following a great gradual process as logical as language itself. Words follow, and finally we enter the field of grammar. Here, the first words to be learned are the names of things. And we see how greatly nature's teaching illuminates our own thought. She is the teacher, nature, and at her behest, the child learns to us um, what to us adults seem the dullest parts of language. And yet the child shows the keenest interest and this lasts well into the next period of his development, from three to five years of age. I think I'll end that with a little kind of anecdote from my nannying as well. Um, 
a nanny, yeah, it was a two-year-old and a five-year-old. And the five-year-old was kind of teasing the two-year-old by saying a made-up word, like bugger boogala or something like that. She was saying that over and over and over and over to this two-year-old. And the two-year-old was so adamant at finding out what she meant by this word. The two-year-old goes, what, what, what boogala? What boogala? Tell me. And then he turns to me and says, Anya, what boogala? Like, even if it's teasing or something, they're so interested and so curious as to get their hands around these sounds and figure out what they mean and able to express their world more with what they've learned. So, um, yeah, that'll, that's my 